when we hear the words, I came that they might have life and have it in abundance. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. What does abundant life look like? Is it just for a few chosen sheep? And if it's only for a few chosen sheep, well, what's abundant about that? Truly abundant, abundance is only abundance if it's available to everyone, or in my mind anyway. It got me thinking as I was preparing this week about abundant life and aliveness. And aliveness is a, a common theme in John's Gospel. And it got me thinking about uh, some work, a uh, piece of work that I've been doing with Citroen J.K. with Becca, and that's why Becca's here today, um, around an idea, a concept called the basic income. Now, I don't know if anybody, anybody, anyone has watched the film I Daniel Blake recently. Has anybody seen this film? Anybody? I'm going to be putting on film night for, for this, so, so or anybody can loan this DVD. It's well worth a look. It's, it, it's a story about a gentleman over 50 who's worked all of his life and then suddenly he experiences a heart attack. And as a result of that, he finds himself needing the help of the welfare state. It's not a good experience that he has. And on his journey, he meets a single mom, and she's trying to feed two kids. And she has this daily struggle with trying to feed these two kids. This film left me stunned, I have to say. It also left me thinking, there has to be another way. There has to be another way that gives everyone life. It left me thinking, how do we create a society that gives life to all people? And then I fell upon this idea called the basic income. Now, if you came to Cameo this week, you'd have heard something about the basic income. But for those of you who weren't at Cameo, the bones of, of the idea of, of a basic income is the idea that everybody gets an equal share, enough to cover their basic needs. It's not means tested, you don't have to prove that you, 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 you qualify, it's yours by right. It's paid to each individual as a legal right without testing or means, you don't have to work for it, it's yours, it's given. The, the, the easiest way to understand it, it's a bit like the child benefit, you know, your child benefit and you just get back to your 18, 19 and then, and, and then it stops. Well, it's a bit like that, but you continue to get it. It's non-taxable, but the thing is, it should cover your basic needs. It's not a new concept. It's a concept that originally was, was kind of um, explored by a Muslim caliph. Other people have looked into it. Martin Luther King, the leader of the civil rights movement, he, he advocated it before he was shot. And what he found was that the deprivation in societies he knew it in his day just blew his mind. And actually he found that there are a lot more people from, from white backgrounds living in poverty in America than there were black folk. And so maybe it became, became a, a really, really wider issue. There are countries that are trying this around, trying this out around the world as we speak. And what they're finding is that crime rates go down. Health is improved. People's self-esteem is lifted. Society somehow grows and, and improves. Why do I support this idea? It excites me because it says so 
think about life and life in all its fullness. I wonder if you know anybody for whom this would make a massive difference. Or would this make a difference in your life? I've got some checks here, and on the checks, <coughs> we have the words, what would I do differently if I had universal, a universal income? What would I do differently? So I'm going to give you a check now for £200. Honestly, don't look so good. I'm going to give you a check for £200. Michael, do you want to pass those round? I want you to be thinking about what you would do. What would you do if you. If you found yourself £200 a week, better off, no strings attached, what would you do? How does that make you feel? You know, Joe obviously is smiling when I, when I mention that. Does it, does it bring you any hope? Okay. I'm going to invite you to, if you want to, um, when we have the opportunity, if you place those in the upper tree and um, and then at a later date we're, what we're hoping to do as uh, Citizens UK is to take all the cheques that have been written and present them to the new mayor and district who, who has said that he would like a conversation about this because one of the asks of Citizens UK was um, would the new mayor consider piloting a project uh, a, a, a citizens, a basic income project in the West Midlands, and um, and so we're collecting as many checks as possible to see if uh, how many we can present to the mayor. I just want to read you a few um, of the ones that I collected when I went to Small Heath last week, and I'm sharing this with you with their permission. I know that that uh, I'm not going to give out names, but I'm going to share. Just a few of the things that they said that they would do with an extra £200 a week. One said, I will be able to help other people, I'll be able to have a, a, a holiday, and it will make life a lot easier. Somebody else said, I'll, I'll visit friends more, and I'll share more meals. Someone else said, I'll book a holiday and I'll invest some, some of the money for, for the future. And someone else said, I'd go the mile and I'd give to the poor. I'd give a donation and I'd help others. I'd save it. I'd spend it carefully. I'd keep half towards a better life for my family and I'd give the other half to friends who are in less fortunate circumstances than I am. I'd have a driving test at last. I'd have my driving test and I'd have a little break with the family and then I'd donate some. I'd take 100 and I'd to, and keep that for myself and then I'd give most of the rest away. I'd get some shoes, somebody said, and then I'd give some to the church and then I'd give some to the bills of the church. And someone else said, I'd buy something for myself that I don't often get the chance to do. And then I'd donate some and I'd spend some on a training day. I'd go to New Zealand and say somebody, or obviously I'd put more money to me. Go on holiday, go on holiday. And somebody else said, I'd not have to worry about bills anymore because this would help us pay towards our bills. I'd keep half and I'd give the other half to charity. It strikes me that if you give people more money, they don't automatically keep it for themselves. And trials have proved that uh, you know when when these when 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 these experiments have been carried out, that that is in fact what does happen. People don't waste the money. 
people spend it on improving their lives. I wonder what life would be on if everyone did have enough and poverty was eradicated. It's, I know it's a utopian thought, but you have to ask the question, why? Why do we have that reaction when we think about things like this? Why does it have to be utopian? A documentary, Inventing, Inventing the Future, came up with a beautiful phrase that I thought was fantastic. And they said, pathways of the future must be carved out and paved not merely travelled along in some preordained fashion. We have a choice. We have a voice. And we must use that voice. And we must use our Christian voice. It's the only way that we will grow into full life and life for all. A growing community, John Manley says, must integrate three elements. It must integrate, firstly, a silent life of prayer. And secondly, it must integrate a life of service. Above all, a service of listening to the poor. And thirdly, it must integrate a life through which all its members can grow fully into their own gifting. How beautiful is that? The possibility that everybody could grow into their full gifting. This idea that Martin Luther King um, grabbed onto, you know, he, 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 he put it like this. He said, I'm convinced that the simplest approach will prove to be the most effective type of solution to poverty. And the solution is to abolish it altogether, to abolish it directly by a new, widely discussed measure, the guaranteed income, the basic income. On Friday, I bought a book because you might be asking, well, what, that's all very well, Carol, but what does this have to do with us as Christians? How can we speak into politics? Well, on Friday, I brought this book entitled Citizen Basic Income, A Christian Social Policy. And I just want to read with you three little extracts that have just excited me that this man's work, Malcolm Torrey's work, is just phenomenal. First of all, he says, we might ask ourselves, how do we, how do we make people work? We often say that, don't we? People need to work for a living. And how do we make people work? However, he says, maybe we need to rephrase that question. Maybe the question should be, how can we distribute the proceeds of production in such a way that people are most likely to work? or to do the work that is required to provide the goods and the services that society needs. If we ask this question, if we ask how we can make people work, then we might answer, well, by paying them to work, of course, or we'll just pay them the benefits if they only look for work. But if we ask the second question, then the answer is maybe different. If we give to everyone an unconditional income and we pay people to work, then maybe we'll encourage them. Encourage them to, to be involved in the effort that is required to sustain life. Another extract, wealth is God's gift. Now there's a nugget, isn't it? Wealth is God's gift, and it is intended for the common good and not for the accumulation by a few to the exclusion of men. So if we find that the gift has not been shared out as originally intended, then surely it is our responsibility to ensure that it should be so. Which means collecting resources from those who have benefited disproportionately from their position in the economy in order to pay to every individual a share of the wealth that, the pro the wealth that properly belongs to them and to everyone. A similar secular argument could be made. The physical and the social capital from which we all now benefit has been built up by many generations of hard work and it belongs to all of us, not just a few. It is therefore right to collect some of the proceeds of that shared capital from those who have ended up with disproportionate shares, 
so that we can pay to every member of society a share of the wealth that properly belongs to everyone. For a Christian, both the religious and the secular arguments are relevant. We have received generous gifts from God and from our forebearers, and to all of them we owe an eternal debt of gratitude. No gratitude is due to property owners. Gratitude is due only to God. And to the many generations who have gone before us, and to all of, all of those who work hard to realize the potential of God's abundant gifts. A citizen's basic income, paid regularly to every member of society, would simply just be a distribution of the proceeds of a common inheritance. And so to sum up the book, a citizen's basic income would celebrate God's, God's abundant life to us. It would be an act of grace. It would recognise our individuality. It would recognise God's equal treatment of each and every one of us as created in the image of God. It would provide for the poor, it would judge, it would constantly forgive. It would ensure that workers be paid for their work. It would be a basis of a covenant. Now that's something we're familiar with as Methodists. It would inspire us to be co-bearers or co-creators. It would understand both our original righteousness and our original corruptness. It would recognise that we are mutually dependent on one another. It would facilitate a more just society and promote liberty. It would both revitalise and enhance the family, facilitate the duty to serve, be welcoming and hospitable. It would be an act of love. Citizens' basic income is a Christian social policy, and perhaps the most Christian social policy possible. So the methods by which we might pay for citizens' basic income is that everyone should be treated as equal. And so he finishes with, so let the debate begin. We have a voice as a Christian community. We have a voice in this conversation. I've only just dipped in to this concept, but I just love that idea, this equal treatment of each and every one of us. In the book of Leviticus, we find the Old Testament, short Old Testament passage that says the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, and he said this, The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. The land is mine. And with me you are but aliens and tenants. How different would the world be if we just saw ourselves as tenants merely passing through? 